Hey gang, welcome back to Big Boy. I wanted to touch base here and, and sort of do a level set on this game, uh, less than 60 miles from Thin Red Line Games, and go through my uh, after action report guidelines. And you may say, why am I doing that now when I've only clearly played three turns or so? I think I've seen enough to get a feel for the system. There's a lot more here that we're, we've yet to really sort of fully understand as the case may be, but uh, or appreciate, I guess, is the point to as to how to take advantage of some aspects of the system. But I think I've got enough of a feel for what's going on here to make some general comments about the game uh, with, the <coughs> with the clear caveat that Come uh, next Friday, I'll be playing Opposed, and that will obviously deepen and enrich in my thoughts and opinions on the game one way or another, and plus we'll get two other people's opinions as well. We're going to play a, a, a three-person version of this. Each person will be two Soviet players and one, one NATO player. All right, so let's talk about the, the decision space first of all and what decisions we're making and what challenges you deal with. Well, as for either side, you are really deal dealing with the uh, what in essence becomes a front or a, a, a portion of a theater. I don't recall the correct military term at this point in time, but you get the general gist of it. And uh, that that's your space, right? So as the Soviet player, you'll be dealing with one or more divisions and the regiments and battalions that go into those divisions across the full spectrum of capabilities from electronic warfare and air, in an abstract sense, to uh, all of the rocket-based artillery platforms and uh, missile platforms and mechanized infantry and tanks and all that sort of good fun stuff. So that's your space that you're working in. And, and, and at this scale, at three kilometers, I think it is a hex and three hours a turn. I think that's a very interesting scale to be to be working with. Let me just check the, the, the hex size. It's either three or five kilometers. I forget now. There's a little introduction here somewhere that shouldn't be too hard to find. He said, hopefully. And of course, I can't find it off the top of, off the top of my mind here. Never mind. Uh, if I recall it or see it, all. yeah, five k, five k hexes. <clears throat> Knew I was wrong. So uh, that kind of leads me to so decision space leads me to the role. You're you're clearly in that divisional commander's role. Uh, or uh, perhaps a, a core commander if you were dealing with the Soviets because you'll have, as I said, between one and three divisions uh, to, to work with. Now, the intelligence uh, side of things is pretty interesting as well. There's a lot of information available to, on, uh, to you on the board, but there are mechanisms in the game uh, built around detection, which is uh, a derivative function that was sort of lifted out of and adapted uh, from the NATO division commander, right? So uh, that idea is that, A, you know that there's stuff there, but you don't know necessarily exactly what is there. And if you're trying to hit an, H an enemy HQ, which is a really cool thing to do, uh, I can show you the devastation of that right here. Uh, two out of three points of that uh, fifth corps HQ uh, just got smacked and they're sitting there half engaged, meaning half movement points, <clears throat> etc., etc. And that follow on effect was that uh, I had to take four step or attrition step losses on supporting units. It was a brutal, uh, a brutal event. So, uh, so the intelligence there, if you have the right level of intelligence by applying air and command points and electronic warfare points, you combine those in various ways to attempt to detect a H an HQ, and then you can pummel the daylights out of it. Or alternatively, you know, if you're adjacent to an enemy unit, you can probably see it and well, and you'll have the highest detection rating, i.e. four, and that will allow you then to... Uh, conduct your bombardments and whatnot on the four column versus the one column. Significant difference. Uh, 
Right, objectives. Uh, here, they're all pretty much geographically based for the Soviets and attrition point uh, based for the US uh, NATO forces, right? And that, to me, uh, it's interesting. I, and I don't know, actually, I shouldn't say that. That's what it is for this particular scenario. It may be different for the full campaign. We'll find out next Friday. But uh, you, probably a combination of both for both sides, perhaps. But that's generally speaking. You're capturing towns, moving through them, and uh, obviously looking to try and get your backside into Frankfurt, which would be you know, your launching point to then jump across the Rhine. All right. The granularity on the OB, it's pretty good, right? It's uh, we're down at the battalion level and uh, sometimes even smaller uh, components for various units. So here's a company, for instance, of helos, right? Apaches or whatever they may be. So we're we're down in the down in the weeds on that sort of action, right? Uh, and that that's what's makes that makes it pretty interesting because you've got quite a few Soviet un units, as you can see, not a lot of American forces. And there's a <clears throat> there's a element here that we'll deal with in a second, uh, dealing with conflict that uh, that I think is is really well done here. So uh, so the OB is fine. I mean, I, I don't I don't know the history well enough to say whether uh, there were three companies, uh, three battalions of artillery or two battalions of artillery for the 8th Guards Army, uh, you know, so, uh, divisional or core, divisional level support, right? Who knows? Don't really care. All I know is that someone's put the thought into this here to try and reconstruct what was going on at this specific time for this game, World War III, 1985. Uh, here's the forces at play. It's the, I think it's pretty well done, and the, the counters look nice. We'll get to that in a second, too. Yeah, so conflict, combat, and combat resolution. Uh, very interesting combat system. Takes uh, and lifts a, uh, or gives a nod to, I suppose, the central front system from, from SBI using attrition points, you know, Call them attrition points, call them friction points, call them steps. It's all the same, right? And I, the, the few folks have been getting all pissy and spun up online on the SBI group on Facebook, like a bunch of girls crying about how it's just a, this game's just a copy of some other game, right? Well, it's not, okay? It's completely different. What it does do is honor the design ethos and the thoughtfulness that went into CFS and the uh, uh, NATO division commander and pulls some of the ideas and concepts from them and blends them together very nicely for a new fresh game. You know, let's face it, CFS really was a pretty hackneyed system. It had no air. It had no su real supply rules. You wanted to win as, as NATO. All you had to do was line up one battalion behind the other along the ro main route of advance of the Soviets until they built up 12, 12, 12 or 6 friction points, however much it was, for their division. And the game was over. So it was a pretty pointless system overall. It was interesting because we were growing up and living with that at that time. BAOR, 5th Corps. Fantastic, interesting, fun things to play at the time. Pull it out 15, 20 years later, it's just really ordinary. And then, of course, the, the whole system is ruined by the final two, uh, Northern Front, Dano Front, or whatever they were called, Northern Plains, right? Completely different system, different scale, so the whole thing's destroyed. So... Let's just put all our whining to one side, girls, and uh, let's focus in on the fact that this is a completely different game. It may have some elements from CFS and NDC, but I think you'll find that the gameplay and the, the thoughtfulness that needs to go into the gameplay is significantly different than your smash and crash SPI barely tested uh, magazine game. So let's give the guy who uh, guys the two guys who designed this game paid for it in advance themselves some freaking credit here i'm sorry uh rant over <laughs> all right let's talk about combat speaking of uh, uh, uh conflict so 
combat is interesting because we're using this con this concept of postures and each uh, uh and these postures are taken from ndc right and uh NATO division commander and that <clears throat> that uh, ndc was originally designed for you know the military and then a commercial version came out it was probably sanitized a fair bit had lots and lots of different modes and it was very complicated to change and difficult and things and so many different modes you didn't know which was the right one to use and they didn't they weren't rationalized and didn't necessarily make sense all the time sometimes you would go into a mode and you think hang on a second uh, this is really effective for doing combat but really it's for movement or, or vice versa uh, and to case in point, this this screening or double, I think they called it double and triple zone uh, mode was a little wonky. Here, screening is very effective and it's a core capability that the 11th Armored Cav have to learn how to use uh, because it, it's going to hurt when you're attacked. But boy, is it going to be hard to get to attack you because you're going to be the enemy is going to be paying extra movement points to up to two hexes out as they advance towards you. And if you use interdiction and other things correctly, you're gonna grind the advance to a, a, a halt very quickly. But once they get engaged, as they have here, the Soviets are gonna start working on you pretty hard. Now, unfortunately, this attack didn't go so well here, but that's a whole nother thing. So modes are a very significant element of the game, both for movement rate, for offense and defense combat differential. This is a differential based system, not a, not a, uh, a combat ratio uh, based system. It's, uh, it's using the differential between the, the attack and the defense factors. And it, uh, it, it gels together nicely. You can lay in, layer in on the attacker and defender many different combat support points from air, uh, EW, we can bring obviously barrages in of multiple types, whether that be artillery or rocket based or missile based support. And uh, adjacent units can have an impact. Uh, they will bump your differential up by uh, one. And uh, recon units, because they've gone in and they've done the work, if you've got a recon unit adjacent, you're going to get a plus two. But you only get a plus two if you're prepared to spend an attrition point for that recon unit. So they're going to take some uh, losses potentially or, you know, some fragmentation of their force if they're used in the combat to aid the, the aid that combat. Terrain plays a factor. When you look at the terrain, it can be a little confusing at first because you can see there are multiple terrain types in each hex. And there's a pretty clear table that helps you understand what is what the terrain is in the hex <clears throat> and what are the obstacles in the in the hex or the hex side that will <coughs> excuse me add or detract i'm going to need my water that will add or detract from the the movement cost going into and out of these hexes so so that's that's a thing unto itself as well so the 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 combat uh is, is more also it's not just the fact that the units are fighting each other but that you're perhaps barraging these units first so there's an entire barrage barrage phase for both sides they'll both barrage each other and that may be air attacks it might be helo attacks it might be missiles as i've already mentioned of course artillery uh you got to spend an attrition point. You know, there's five uh, attrition points for an artillery unit, I believe, if I am remembering my rules correctly so far. If I got that here, you have five attrition points, so they can fire five times before they're gone, unless you do uh, some sort of refit and uh, restocking of ammunition and uh, or you know push replacements into a, a given regiment of forces. That's what attrition points are representing: ammunition and people. Uh, you know, guns and beans and uh, and bodies and equipment. So uh, there's so in this sequence of play, there's a lot going on here with the with the game from uh, the choices you're going to be needing to make. You're going to be needing to look uh, in advance uh, a turn or two to make the right choices about the mode or posture that your forces are in, whether your headquarters are deployed whether you want to change from divisional defense to battalion attack or from, uh, you know, core defense or whatever it may be, you know, you're going to be thinking about all this stuff because you have a really strictly limited number of command points to be leveraged to allow you to change your mode. 
and all these modes of change take time, right? So you put these time markers on, and that's going to allow you to tell you when uh, we get to the 1800 hour turn, that's when that mode will kick in and take, uh, take effect. Even if you wanted to just uh, change an individual unit's mode, like this guy's in the screen mode, right? If I wanted to change him, even that guy is going to have to spend a turn to change out of screening into deliberate defense or prepared defense or hasty attack or whatever it may be. Uh, and there's, there's restrictions on which mode you can easily change into or out of. All of that dovetails into this intelligence gathering and detection capabilities and the barraging and the combat and the movement. And you've got to be, you know, uh, thinking ahead or you're going to end up like these guys on the right here trying to catch up because you left it too late to move or left it too late to make a mode change or whatever the case may be. Anyway, so that's uh, so the so the conflict and combat resolution stuff all kind of blends together in with the the postures and the command and control capabilities, right? So it's pretty important stuff. Logistically, you're not really worrying about too much. There are the, there is a notion of a supply counter. Uh, so here's a supply counter here, right? That's really to make sure that <clears throat> you're managing more managing the flow to and from the various units, combat units in the field, and pushing you know additional ammunition and, and uh, uh, you know equipment to them, right? Uh, Soviets have a four hex range for their uh, supply hub, and the uh, NATO forces have a six. Uh, six hex range on their supply hubs and they're not gonna it's not gonna it's not gonna kill you you're not gonna be surrounded and isolated and therefore unable to fight all it is really trying to represent because of the time scale right all it's trying to represent is hey if you want to take attrition off you need to be in supply so there's there's that concept lots of cool narrative like this thing is deep and rich in narrative when you've got you know this uh, this regiment uh, advancing up here on the flank and try to attack and, and engage these guys, and then these guys came up and they uh, ordered in a big barrage, and then you get to you know look and see what the results of that are. And the recon unit was adjacent, so it could have added uh, its two points uh, benefit to them to them, but you know they decided not to do that for to save the points for later. And they go in and do their, their big old attack here and the air is flying in and the choppers are uh, pounding things and lots of good good uh, story coming out of the backside of that thing. Uh, let's see. Replayability. Now this is the thing, I think, particularly with this smaller scenario, I don't know how much replay value you'll get past four or five plays. I think mainly because, I'm saying that because you really have a limited number of uh, options in terms of your advance out of Eastern Germany, right? You, you, there's only a couple of ways you can come, but do you want to come all along one route and you know blow up the first division and then have those guys peel off to one side and then let the second division go through? Or are you going to split the difference like I have here? Don't know. So that, I think there's some certainly some exploration here that you can get into you can choose different postures to start with you can choose different defensive postures to start with and experiment with those and see how they work how heavy heavily are you going to rely on air for defense versus offense uh, capabilities where are you going to how badly are you going to attrit your forces before you uh, decide to have them step step uh, aside for the next echelon so I think there's a, a good amount of gameplay to be had here, but I I, I imagine with the full campaign, oh, and there's another two or three divisions that are going to be added to this board, then we're really going to be talking about some pretty significant uh, replay value because you'll have a lot more options and a lot more units on the board. And you're going to... This game's not going to play fast. You're going to be taking your time here and thinking things through just because of the difficult terrain and the roads and the compound effect of all the unit the units have upon each other when they're trying to drive over or past each other you're going to have to think about stuff so it's going it's a, going to be a a deliberately played and thought out game 
The good news is you can't really min-max combat, so there'll be none of that going on too much. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I, I think there's good replay value here. Quite a decent amount of play time per turn, probably, in general. I'm, for me, soloing, I think we're averaging about an hour a turn. Uh, right now, first turn took a lot longer than second and third turn has. Uh, let's talk about components. Pretty good, right? I think the counter's a little thin. I would have liked to have seen a thicker counter. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the uh, NATO symbols on the graphics. I'm not sure that that necessarily works 100% for me, but it seems to carry it off on the map just fine. Uh, a few folks have commented on the color scheme for the information counters. Yeah, it doesn't bother me. Uh, it, it, it's fine. Just not everything needs to be white or black. I don't have no issue with orange information counters and green, lime green, or whatever color green you call this. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with any of these shades, these red and purple shades here. You may have some issues if you're colorblind, and I'm sorry if you are, right? But, but you know, that these guys are Italian. What do you expect? <laughs> they're going to have, they have a little flair. Uh, love the map. Love the detail on the map. It's beautiful. It's, to me, it's, uh, it's beautiful in the it's simplicity of it. And it, and you know, it kind of harkens back to the old SBI days where there, you know, the cities are just blotches of red. It's not, 4,000 little micro graphics of a building. So this is uh, this should appeal to some of the purists and some of the older older war gamers. You should you should like some of this stuff, I think. But uh, who knows? Anyway, that was a rather loud noise, wasn't it? All right, maps, counters, rules. Hey, the rules look uh, charts are awesome. The rule book to me. It's a little, uh, I'm, I'm digging around places here and I've got my rules marked up so it's a lot easier now. It start, kind of starts out in the order of play and then it gets out of the order of play and some concepts are discussed before, which are key concepts, are discussed before you even know how to move or shoot. And I, and I think if I was doing this rule book, I would not have done it in this order or format necessarily. Uh, I think it could have been done better. There are some things in this rule book that need to be on charts. For instance, the number of uh, steps that a unit can take before it dies. That should be on the unit's legend where the unit size is. There should be a second column there that has a core has five steps and a, 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 a core, sorry. A regiment has five steps, a battalion has four steps, a company has three steps, and a HQ has two steps, uh, three steps, and all that sort of fun stuff. That should have all been on there. That's just uh, some common pra common sense practicality. And I know what's probably happened here is, you know, the two guys who've uh, designed this game, uh, you know, Fabrizio and Marco, they're, you know, they're, uh, they're getting at it and having fun, and they're playing it. And they may be play testing it with others, but they're guiding people. And so rather than having the people actually pick the game up and work it out for themselves, they're, they're guide, probably guiding them. Uh, I'm guessing here now, totally guessing. Right? But I think that uh, because of the, the probably the smaller sized team and there's probably a smaller sized play testing unit, that uh, there was not a lot of thought put into some of these uh, extra little bits that would have made it a lot easier to jump into the game just a little bit faster. I'll, as I said, the charts are awesome in general. There are a few little niggles, but very well laid out, very cleanly spaced, nice fonts, nice paper, well done. Uh, overall, a enjoyable experience. Uh, so that makes the rules digestible, but you're going to have to go back a couple of times. And, you know, where is that bit about detection and what happens when something's engaged and what's the difference between half engaged and engaged? And you have to go, you're going to dig around a little bit. So that's kind of, you know, by beware, you're you're getting into this. If you're getting into this, you're probably not going to balk at that sort of thing. It's 31 pages of rules or 34 or something like that. It's not significant. Uh, and it's all very point-based and easy to read. So I think you'll be fine. How's that? All right. I wanted to give you those quick, oh, geez, quick 25 minutes. All right. Well, there you go. Less than 60 miles, 
a wonderful first effort, I think, a uh, noble nod to SBI's history and a interesting and innovative and different game than either of, it, of its uh, its predecessors. It really has taken the DNA from some of those from those two games and uh, woven something new out of it. And you've got a uh, a fresh, interesting perspective on World War III set in 1985. So. Uh, if you're interested, you should go check them out They're on trlgames.com, wherever they are, and uh, have a look at it. Probably not going to be a whole lot of reruns of this done in terms of printing because, you know, it's a small shop, like I said, and they pay for it all up front. So I don't know how many copies they printed, probably 500 to 700. And uh, hopefully it's selling well. I like it, and we'll be playing more of it next Friday. All the best.